Hello and welcome to today's ARC web window on the topic of decarbonization. Today, my colleague Luciano will talk about the topic of decarbonization. He is our expert on this topic. <laughs> and I would give over the word, word to Luciano. Luciano, peace. Thank you, Rene. And thanks everyone for joining. So as Rene mentioned, today we're going to talk about decarbonization technologies. First of all, let me give you some context about what are, why are we doing this webinar? So in ARC, we started our research in decarbonization in November last year. And our first step was to approach people in the industry, asset owners that are dealing directly or indirectly with sustainability issues. And we started to define the scope of the research with them by discussing topics like why are companies investing in decarbonization, the business drivers behind this, what are the company's roadmaps, the technologies that are being applied or that are being explored to achieve the decarbonization objectives. So this is how we define the scope of the research. And the next step was to check the solutions that are available today. We want to check how well are the solution providers fulfilling the need in the market? We're going to quantify the markets on these solutions. And after finish the research, we will share the results for free for, with all the asset owners that contributed to our research. The report will be also available for everyone who wants to receive this information. The objective is to create a report that hopefully will inspire people and that will help the industry to move forward. So this is the agenda for today. It's a little bit tight, but we will try to fulfill and uh, to fill in all the topics. So we start with a short introduction and then we will just discuss about different questions related to decarbonization. We start with the why are companies or should companies invest in decarbonization? We'll continue to how are chemical companies planning to achieve their objectives. Then we will discuss about the technologies. What technologies are they using? And I will close with some conclusions and reflections. And hopefully, we will have some time for questions and answers. So let's start with the introduction. Decarbonizing the industry is a complex challenge, and the solutions are quite diverse. It requires a deep change a transformation in, uh, in how the companies are managing their business. So in order to order our ideas and give some structure to the research, I choose the approach from Simon Sinek, which is the golden circle. So here, we don't focus on the technologies, on the solutions, but we start asking ourselves, why do we need them? In this context is why are companies investing in decarbonization? We will start discussing about why, and of course, behind everything is the climate change, but there should be also business drivers behind all of these initiatives. Then we will go on the how, and here we're going to explore the company's roadmaps to achieve their decarbonization objectives. And finally, we will review different technologies. What technologies are the company using to achieve these objectives? So let's start with the why. I would start by putting the challenge in simple by, but overwhelming numbers. I got this uh, inspiration from a book that I was recommended to read. It's uh, How to Avoid Climate Disaster by um, Bill Gates, really good. So what does it mean to reach net zero? We need to eliminate 54 billion tons of CO2 equivalent that human activity is emitting every year. We need to replace 137,000 terawatts of energy that is currently being produced using coal, oil, or natural gas. And we need to stop, well not stop, but replace a business inertia related to fossil fuel industries of about $7.2 trillion per year. So this is the challenge today, and how urgent is it? Well, 
By 2050, we are expecting around 20% more people in this world. But it's not only about that. We want to eliminate hunger and poverty. We want to increase the health and the access to water. But you can imagine that this will require even more energy and more industry. So if we are talking about urgency, for sure we need to start now. And we need to start with all the resources that we can. So scientists are telling us that the temperature in the planet is the highest in the last 100,000 years. And one of the main reasons are the emissions caused by human activities. So what role is playing chemical industry here? By itself, the chemical industry represents around 6% of global emissions. But reaching net zero in the chemical industry, I will show you how, how it will have an impact on other sources like agriculture industry, landfill wastes, and even fugitive emissions coming from energy production. So we truly believe that chemical industry will play an important role in this challenge. But as I told you, Companies need to stay profitable. So there should be a business case behind all the decarbonization investments. So we went out and asked through interviews, one-to-one -one interviews with the asset owners and also through service that reach both asset owners and solution providers. And we asked them to rank the business drivers behind decarbonization initiatives. So what you see in this graph at the left bar, you will see what the asset owners think are the main business drivers. And at the right bar, you see what the solution providers think. So the main um, business driver, according to asset owners, is cost efficiency. And I can totally see this. So in an energy intensive industry like chemical, and considering the current energy crisis and the pressure that governments are putting in the companies to transition to more expensive energy sources, the green energy. I can totally understand why asset owners think that these are the main business drivers behind mm -hmm. today. The solution providers believe that one of the main business drivers is related to compliance, which is somehow underestimated by asset owners. So the reflections I got from the interviews with asset owners was basically that they don't see big consequences with related to compliance. They don't see a possibility to lose the license to operate. There are no high fines, big fines for not complying with local legislation. But keep something in mind, not complying with the regulation to really affect the image of the companies. Another business driver that I would like to highlight is the investor pressure, which was somehow underestimated by both sides. We already know cases in the industry where companies are investing in their decarbonization uh, initiatives to achieve the sustainability objectives because they have loans that are bonded to sustainability goals. So investment groups like BlackRock, they are pushing companies to in, achieve their sustainability goals or, or the interest rates will go high. So you can believe, you can see that there will be a business driver, a business case behind this as well. So now that I convince you hopefully why chemical industry should invest in decarbonization, I will jump to the how. So how are they planning to achieve this? Before going to that, I would like to categorize a little bit the emissions by its scope. Probably you already know about this. So emissions are grouped in three scopes. Scope one are the direct emissions that are coming from the facility. If we're talking about chemical industry, a clear example are the flue gas coming from heaters or boilers. Fugitive emissions coming from pressure safety valve that failed to close. Uh, we have byproducts uh, like nitrogen oxides or VOC emissions. 
Scope two are the indirect emissions related to the energy that the company is purchasing. I'm talking about, for example, electricity or steam that is purchasing from third parties. If they are produced uh, using fossil fuels, they will have emissions related to it. Scope three is the most relevant. And these are all the indirect emissions related to the whole value change of the products that are not considered in scope two. But I'm talking from the feedstock until the treatment and the end of life of the product. And according to the sustainability reports that we have in scanning, scope three is the most relevant. Why do I want to explain this? Well, if we talk about scope one and two, then it is correct to talk about decarbonizing and decarbonization technologies because we want to eliminate the emissions coming from these sources. But when we refer to scope three, decarbonizing an industry that basically works with hydrocarbons to produce their products is not the correct word. So in this case, we will talk about defossilization. And this is also a concept that I was uh, that I learned during my interviews. The approach here is basically to stop um, extracting hydrocarbons from the earth and start that will finally end up in our environment and start using what we already have above the surface. It's about creating a carbon circular economy. I will come back to this later. So we went and reviewed several sustainability reports from major chemical companies that have operation worldwide. And we took some common points there. So most of these companies, they are committing to reach net zero in 2030. Some of them earlier in 2025, actually. Others, as the one that I'm showing you here, they are going until 2035, scope one and two. What we see is that most of the companies are able to quantify scope one and two, and they are struggling to calculate scope three. They are able to quantify also the impact on these initiatives in the scope one and two, as you see in the graph that I'm showing you there. The main strategies that we see are first transition to renewable energy, and especially in wind and solar through power purchase agreements or investing in their own facilities. They talk about also uh, about fuel conversion. So starting to use other fuels, like for example, electrical fuels, biofuels, and some are talking about uh, transition to LNG. So LNG is not going to help them to reach net zero, but it's going to help them to reduce the carbon emissions for sure. Many companies are also talking about power to steam and basically is using electricity to generate steam. Some of the companies are also mentioned divestment. And for sure, divestment will help them to achieve their net zero objective, but it's for sure not helping the industry. So we went a little bit more in detail on these solutions, on these roadmaps. As solution providers and mainly asset owners, what do they believe are the solutions that will have major impact? And what would we believe it will have, a, what level of effort they will need? So by combining these two, we got this graph that I'm showing you here. And for sure, you are already thinking on some exceptions to what we see here. Still, I think it's a good starting point. So up to the left, we have the low hanging fruits. We have here all the solutions that will require relatively low effort. And it is believed that will have a high impact in decarbonization. And the most clear one here is energy efficiency. Now, a comment about this energy efficiency, it's an enabler. It's not going to take you to reach your net zero objectives. But it's believed, and we believe, that you need to work on the energy efficiency to reach that. I will talk a little bit more about technologies related to this later on. 
Another example is electrification here. So electrification for sure will play a big role to reach net zero in the industry. But there are some projects that require relatively small efforts, but if we really want to make a difference, we need to invest more. And I will show you some big projects going on that will help the industry to heavily reduce the carbon emissions. Something that I was surprised is why the people believe that there is no a big impact on electrification. And based on the interviews that I have, I understood actually that if we don't achieve to feed the electrification with green electricity, for sure the impact will be very limited. So now that I explain you or I share with you some roadmaps and how the companies are planning to achieve their objectives, I will start to describe some of the technologies that we found that are relevant that will help the companies to do this. First of all, if you want to manage something, if you want to improve something, anything, the first step is to measure it. And as I told you, companies are finding big challenges to measure the scope three of their emissions. They are able to calculate scope one and two using direct uh, measurements in their facilities. And they are using industrial average values to calculate all the carbon footprint of the product. But we need to transition to more real and accurate data, more transparent and traceable calculations and more dynamic. Can you think on any technology that will help us on this? Well, blockchain as a digital open ledger for sure will take a big role to overcome this challenge. And companies like Siemens with the product Seagreen are exploring these solutions. Next, I would like to talk about energy efficiency. We ask solution providers to tell us what do they expect will be the impact from different technologies and how well are they covering the solution? The two that I would like to highlight here are the uh, burning efficiency, in this case, steam boiling efficiency, but it's also related to heaters and variable speed drives. In case of burning efficiency, it is about adding sensors to your system that will help you to regulate the amount of oxygen that you are feeding to the flame, depending on the characteristics of the fuel that you are using. This will help you to reach the most efficient combustion. So references from the industry are saying that small variations in the oxygen could lead to big savings in fuel consumption. The other technology is are the variable speed drive. So a variable speed drive will help you to regulate the amount of energy and equipment is consuming depending on the power that is needed. You can gain about 50% in energy efficiency, but it will depend on the type of equipment you want to drive. But you can imagine how important is this especially during the startup of equipment. Let me jump to the next group of technologies. The next one is related to fugitive emission. The reaction I got from the interviews and uh, the service is that people do not think that there will be a big impact on decarbonization by focusing on fugitive, fugitive groups. And I can understand that for the chemical industry, but further development on these technologies will help to reduce the fugitive emissions related to energy production, which is a major source of emissions. So here are some technologies that I wanted to point out, like acoustic leak detectors, wireless sen acoustic sensors, cameras powered by artificial intelligence, gas monitors that have been there for many years already, of course, but also drones and robots that are equipped by with special devices that are helping companies to identify if they are leaks. From all of this, I find one 
especially interesting, which is the wireless acoustic sensor. So imagine a sensor which is not intrusive and does not require any cabling. It just works with a battery that would last for 10 years. So how easy can this be uh, to install? You can put this at the output of a pressure safety valve, and it will help you to see the tech if the safety valve is failing to close. You can put it to, you can link it to a steel trap, and it will tell you if the trap is failing as well. So for sure, there is a quick win related to this type of uh, technologies. The next, for sure, is one of the major players that is driving the industry to reach their decarbonization objectives. And it's about electrification, but from green electricity. So companies are investing mainly in wind and solar. You have big companies like BSF that are investing in their own huge um, wind farms. There are other companies that they are uh, investing in power purchase agreements to ensure their portion in the green electricity production. Some companies are investing in solar panels, in their own facilities to reduce the, the amount of energy that they produce using fossil fuels. But what about nuclear? Nuclear is statistically safer than oil and gas. It requires less amount of space and less amount of materials to produce the same amount of energy than wind and solar. So for sure, nuclear will play a big role here. Companies like Dow are actually exploring the uh, implementation of advanced small modular nuclear power uh, plants in their own facilities. How can we use this electricity in our process? Many companies, as I told you, are talking about power to heat and basically saying we use electricity to produce heat. Technologies that are mentioned have been mentioned a lot are, for example, industrial heat pumps. So this is a solution from uh, Siemens, which can reach 270 degrees Celsius, or electric heater, also from Siemens, which can reach higher temperatures, but, but requiring even more uh, energy, of course. And we have electric boilers or hybrid boilers from CETA. One example that I would like to highlight is this electrically heated steam cracker that uh, is being built here in Germany. So BASF, Sabic, and Linde, they are working on a pilot project that if it is um, scaled, it could help them to reduce 90% of their scope one and two, can imagine, emissions. But using electricity has its limitations, and especially from wind and solar, where we actually produce when we have wind and sun and sunlight. So an alternative is to use the electricity to produ produce, um, produce synthetic fuel or electrical fuel. So imagine this. You take the hydrogen that you are producing using the electricity that you, from uh, a wind farm, or solar or solar panels, and you combine it with the carbon from the carbon dioxide that you capture in another industry, and then you can produce electric methanol, for example, or electric methane, for example, or you can combine the hydrogen with nitrogen to produce green ammonia. So. One example of this is this project from Neom in Saudi Arabia. They are building a plant that using four gigawatts of electricity coming from solar and wind, they will produce 600 tons of hydrogen in the form of green ammonia per day. Now, green ammonia can help you in two ways. You can actually use it as a fuel, but mainly you use it as a fertilizer. 
So this will help to reduce the emissions coming from the agroindustry as well. Next, I would like to spend some minutes with the technology of carbon capture, storage, and utilization. Through the interviews that I had, usually the reaction with this solution is that it's an expensive and inefficient alternative to reach net zero. But actually, for some industries like steel or cement production, carbon capture is actually the only solution that we have until now. For other industries, like for example, chemical industry, it is more expensive than the uh, usual way of producing chemicals, but it's less expensive than the green option that I just showed you before. So you can see it here in this graph from the uh, International Energy Agency, where they show that actually carbon capture is a cheaper option than the electric or green ammonia that I shared with you before. So I think that carbon capture will still play an important role helping companies to achieve their net zero objectives. An example from the industry is also in here in the north of Germany, is the Blue High Now project, which will use natural gas coming from Norway to produce hydrogen using wind from offshore farms. It is blue hydrogen, so it means that actually they will produce carbon dioxide, but it will be captured and then shipped to um, <coughs> sorry, underground reservoirs offshore. This plant, this place will also receive carbon dioxide coming, capture and coming from other industry poles in uh, North Europe. So for sure, it will help the industry to move forward in their net zero challenge. Last but not least, is how to approach the scope three. In this case, a more correct will be to talk about defossilization. So basically, the idea behind is stop pumping up hydrocarbons from the earth because they will end up in our environment. We need to start using the hydrocarbons that are already above the surface. We need to use sources like CO2, as I mentioned you to generate green ammonia, biomass, and also through recycling. So the Renewable Carbon Initiative that is led by NOVA Institute is an organization focused on this concept. They are working together with companies in the chemical industry, exploring these solutions. One example, as I told you, is the green ammonia that I mentioned before. Another example from the industry is the company Pure Cycle. They are focusing on recycling polypropylene, which is a plastic that is in many of the plastic, uh, many of the products that we use every day, but sadly, is hardly recycled. I would like to share with you some conclusions and reflections. So. <clears throat> One is at a professional level, the other one is more at a personal level. I would like to start with a reflection from uh, this author, American author, <laughs> Kevin Kelly, which is, he's saying that we should be optimistic, not because our problems are smaller, but because our capacity to solve them is larger. So I started this webinar showing you how big, complex, and urgent is the challenge that we have ahead. But I'm also showing you different technologies that are being already been used or are being explored and further developed that will help us to reach the net zero objective. And let me give you an example that I'm, I also took from the uh, book from Bill Gates. But this is an example that actually happened. So in the late 60s, this American biologist, Paul Elrich, 
He anticipated that during the 70s and 80s, millions of people will die on starvation because of the population growth and the lack of capacity of the industry to feed all the people. But Paul Elrich didn't count on our capacity to find solutions to these complex challenges. An example of this is Norman Borland. So <clears throat> this American agronomist won the Nobel Prize in 1970 because of his study that helped to create a new variety of wheat with bigger seeds that help that is helping farmers to produce much more food by square meter in their farms. It is said that Norman Vorlau saved millions of people from starvation and that he is the father of the Green Revolution. So if this happened already, I think we can believe that it can happen as well for the challenge related to emissions that we have currently. The next reflection is more at a personal level. <clears throat> so, <clears throat> sorry, what do you, what do you think? What do you feel when you see a picture like this? Would you take your family to use this uh, chairlift? Would you take your kids, your spouse? Do you think government will ever allow a chairlift like this to operate today? No, for sure not. Well, this was normal 50 years ago. This happened 50 years ago. The people accepted and the government accepted. So what about this picture here? This is normal today. One third of the food that is produced is wasted or looked. It costs the global economy around a trillion dollars per year. And it's believed that it's related to eight, between eight and 10% of global emissions. So my proposal is that we need to start building a culture based on purpose, so our kids or our grandchild will see this picture not in 50 years, but in 20 years from now, and they will feel the same, and they will think the same as we think with the picture with the chairlift. So thank you. And <clears throat> to close, I would like to share with you the journey ahead uh, with ARC. This webinar is part of our initiative and we're going to discuss further on this topic during our forum in Sitges in Barcelona in May uh, this year. You're all welcome to come. We're planning to release the first version of our research on June and we are going to discuss all the highlights during the Achema event here in Germany. And further, we're planning to organize more webinars to create working groups focused on decarbonization and to continue researching on this topic. So if you want to get involved, don't hesitate to contact me. You have the, all the details in this slide. And uh, please, you can contact me by email or by LinkedIn. I'm always willing to discuss these topics.